Our next session is aptly titled BIPOC-led funds that are leading the way. To deep dive on this, let me now introduce and welcome our next set of panelists. Trevor Parham co-founded the Oakland Black Business Fund that is aimed at empowering the Oakland's Black business entrepreneurs with capital and technical assistance and growth strategy. Samala is an early stage investor focused with, on working with founders of exceptional, unconventional, and unprecedented backgrounds. Kobe Fuller is a partner at Upfront Ventures and has also founded and incubated Balance, a platform to unlock the economic opportunity for the Black professionals. And Ernst Valerie, a Melking Community Fellow at MIT's CoLab, is a tireless community activist and an investor who's passionate about investing in select, underserved, yet emerging opportunities. Welcome everyone. To get the ball rolling, let me ask Trevor to elaborate on what are some of the ways to accelerate fair capital access to our BIPOC entrepreneurs. Trevor? Thank you, Priyanka. And, and it's nice to be here with everyone today. Um, a big part of this, this conversation that we're having is not just sort of the, the activities and the, the roles that, that BIPOC fund managers play right now, but also before we get into the doing of the work itself, what are things that need to be changed structurally in order to make the work most impactful? So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today and the reason that we brought this particular panel today is that all of these investors that, are, that you're going to hear from are people who are really focused on, on changing power dynamics, changing the narrative on entrepreneurship overall, and, and changing the focus from simply including people to actually focusing on justice and focusing on making sure that with these fund managers and the positions that they're in, they're actually able to hold positions of power that are going to allow us to do things differently in leadership roles, um, not in roles where we're simply asking and campaigning um, and, and trying to change policy, but we're actually focused on just creating an entirely new paradigm so that we can support those people from those communities that we come from. Um, we're really taking a for us, by us type of mentality with this, um, while at the same time wanting to work with everyone else in the ecosystem, we understand that it requires us to essentially um, take the lead in looking after our own to make sure that we're able to speak not just to um, making sure that everyone is, is brought to the table, but also speak to the fact that there's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of value out there that is overlooked on a regular basis. And we don't simply want to say that we're going to be helping people that need development and need support and, and growth, but there's actually people who have already grown, who have already developed, and simply are, are not getting access to that capital. So um, I'm gonna pause there and ask each of our panelists to maybe speak briefly on the work that they do and why they feel that it's important for fund managers like ourselves to be in these positions, especially at this time right now. So uh, I'll start with uh, with Kobe Fuller from Upfront Ventures. Yeah, it's great to be here with everyone. Excited to have this conversation. And for me, this is an area that I'm incredibly passionate about and realize the position I'm in as a venture capitalist managing a pretty significant fund that I have the ability to drive change and I don't take my voice for granted in terms of how it can affect my peers, whether they're, um, you know, you know, black or, or, or non-black in terms of how they can look at diverse founders. And the vehicle that I've been leveraging to do this is a platform that I started a couple of years ago called, called Valence. And Valence was created as a method towards bringing the black professional universe together through a digital platform that allowed for anyone within this community to connect, find, work with, and just 
leverage one another to drive growth and ultimately uh, black wealth. And for me, so much of the issue is like, how do we actually illuminate so much of the black excellence that's out here in a way that there's more transparency around who's within this network and that we can connect individuals in this network with those folks who want to build with them. And part of the, the, the actual way in which we can drive value here is connecting this community with all the relevant capital sources that are out there, whether they're you know, BIPOC led funds or frankly, non BIPOC led funds. And one of the ways in which I approach the problem is by creating about a year ago, a valence funding network initiative where I went out to all of my peers and other funds and had them go on valence in a designated organization that we call the valence funding network and essentially broadcast it out that all these VCs are there to connect with founders and be able to either one, fund their ideas or two, just give them help, give them resources, give them perspective on what it takes to actually be in the position to actually raise VC dollars. And for me, part of what I wanted to do is just find a better mechanism by which to bridge the gap between all the amazing black founders are out there or potential founders in the making, people that actually have ideas, but they need to find ways in which they can actually cultivate them into you know, backable business opportunities and then connect them to all the appropriate dollars that would be willing to fund their ideas. But on top of that, I wanted to make sure that we're creating more of an efficient market where all the exceptional black founders out there that are in the position to raise significant, whether it be pre-seed, seed, series A or larger rounds, that they weren't taken advantage of by funds that were going off and potentially giving them you know, lower deals and not the fair share uh, investments that other, frankly, um, you know, non-black founders were getting. So, so what I did with the Valence Funding Network is create almost like this mechanism by which founders that either may have been on balance or non-balance, I was practically connecting them and making sure that all the VCs that are out there knew that like, hey, like this company's doing really well, like you should be aware they may be raising a series A, series B, so that when they go out there, it's not like this one fund that then gives them the first term should they take. Like, no, I want to actually have a bidding war for the best founders that are out there because that's just the way venture works. And that's the way I've been really approaching, approaching this whole initiative is through leveraging technology, transparency of the network and creating more efficient markets around how our communities gets their best fair share. Wow. That's awesome, Kobe. And, and it, for those of you who have not heard of Valence Network yet, um, I, I strongly recommend that you check it out and see both uh, the network itself and then sort of the technology platform that it leverages, but then also um, to attend some of their events. I, I was lucky enough to uh, participate in a conversation about two months ago about uh, equity crowdfunding that was a valence sponsored event and I just think that you know to your point Kobe what you all are doing both for professionals overall but then also specifically for for funders and entrepreneurs really speaks to this and you know I think that when we when we look at community a lot of what we're also talking about is that there are people in these communities that are active that are that are getting noticed that aren't necessarily noticed in other sort of mainstream uh, investment conversations. And so, you know, Samala, I know when, when you and I speak about this, a big part of, of your focus also is identifying people that you, you already champion as being incredible at the work that they do, but they're not necessarily part of, you know, other larger conversations or other sort of mainstream networks and communities. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your work and, and some of the things that you've accomplished so far with that focus and that approach. Yeah, sure. And uh, I want to start off by also just like thanking this community and the invitation and Trevor in particular. Um, I said yes, yes to this, strength, like purely on the strength of the relationship with Trevor. We've known each other for a while, but when I dug into this, um, I was really excited about it. My mom was born on a farm, grew up on a farm. Uh, I'm like first generation Filipina American. So um, being in this virtual space with people who care deeply about food and ag, uh, is very close to my heart. And you know, to give a little bit of background into who I am and how I came to like be part of this conversation now, I was mostly on the operator side of things. Um, my career has mostly been as an entrepreneur and I still consider myself an entrepreneur. And something that I noticed maybe in my late twenties, early thirties, the more pedigree, the more prominent, the more recognition I was getting from my work, the more invitations I got, you know, like closed door meetings or even had an opportunity to speak at the White House when Obama was president. Um, 
I noticed that when I looked at the world around me as I was getting more and more accolades, got more male and more white, and I saw less of myself reflected in the rooms I was in. And it was, it got to a point where it was like kind of stark. And I, I took some time and like really took notice of um, what is happening? <laughs> like, what is this experience? Like I am succeeding, I am being recognized. I am getting a lot of attention. I'm getting more access to funding. And I am seeing less and less people that look and feel like me, not just purely on demographics, but by my, back, my background as a child of, an immig of children of immigrants, political refugees, um, it started getting really lonely. And I made a very, very conscious um, pivot into being on the investor side of the table because just time and time again, I started bumping up what felt like an upper limit of who I could work with and like the caliber of people accessible to me. And when I tried to bring people um, into those rooms, you know, it didn't always feel like they were being judged or assessed fairly. Like I had to leverage my social capital so heavily just to get certain people into the rooms. And I was always happy to do it, <clears throat> but I was almost never happy with the results that it produced. You know, like the amount of vetting that I had to do instead of being like, this person is brilliant. Like I, don't know how to tell you more that you really need to take this meeting with them, like, and, and like vouch for people. And so I, I pretty much muscled my way into early stage investing because I, you know, especially after the year that was 2020, which was as in a lot of ways and still is devastating. It also was just such a huge eye opener in terms of there are a lot of systems and structures that need to change. Like some stuff is working too well for some people and not at all for others. And it just like can't stand anymore. And I think with what's going on socially, politically, environmentally, we're in maybe like at most a three to five year window to just dream and imagine wildly what's possible. And I think that BIPOC, BIPOC black, brown, female, folks who have been forced to margins in so many different contexts, especially in the context of America, um, I do fundamentally believe have disproportionately bigger imaginations. Because when you come from a background where society, systems, and structures are like stacked against you, like like kind of actively hostile, you have no fidelity to them continuing on the way that they do. So I think you know some folks are gonna feel, imagine, build differently and have systems and structures that are going to be hopefully like this is kind of what I'm betting like literally betting on like folks who haven't been served by systems and structures are going to build better ones that at least serve their communities better like let's at least give that a try and see how that happens and like what kind of results that produces and um, one of the speakers in the last panel said something that really strikes a chord with me because it's very much how we um, think about working with entrepreneurs is we're not trying to squeeze every penny out. We're not trying to extract value from a great idea. How much can we participate in the creation of that value? How can we magnify exponentially the value of that one idea? Like how many more minds, how many more communities, how many more resources um, can we bring to bear? And I think a lot of that is capital, yes. Um, right now, capital, is, like I've heard so many people say this in like the DC world, like capital is cheap because it is like there's a flood of capital. But like, what are you going to do to help make sure, I don't know, a BIPOC founder is successful? A lot of that is going to be, how can you make an intentionally opaque industry more transparent? How can you kind of like pull the curtain back, show like, you know, the old Wizard of Oz is just a dude with like a megaphone, <laughs> like demystify the process, demystify what a term sheet looks like, what market terms are. Um, what to expect walking into a meeting then, you know, like I think there's a lot of um, code switching that founders would be happy to do if they even understood like that there was a premise of that happening. Like when you walk into a room that there's a vernacular, that there's a way of speaking, that there are certain uh, phrases that you'll be expected to know and trying to like basically make cheat sheets for people. All the things that I've learned in the past couple of decades, like how can I put that to a one page and be like, here are the 12 things that like you just really need to know off the top of your head. Um, you could make your way through a lot of this, like these 12 things don't come out of your mouth, like you might not get a serious look. And that sucks, but it's also just like the reality and hopefully a temporary one. And I'll stop there because I know we want to hear from Ernst too. Yeah, thank, thanks to Mal and I, you know, we, we have known each other for, for quite a while and have, had very sort of similar parallel experiences being in some of the same institutions ourselves. Um, 
and understanding what it takes to sort of navigate those things and and also play the play a certain game but understand also that it really is a game and it's kind of a silly game um but ultimately to your point we still have to leave the breadcrumb trail for everyone else behind us to make sure that other people are able to navigate these systems in the same way because it's you know it really is just a construct right and so we're focused on deconstructing but then also putting ourselves as you said in in the room with the with the capital folks and being able to drive change at that level because ultimately it's not about you know you or i just kind of getting into the room it's how do we create our own room and then create doors that are big, big enough to let everybody in so um with that, I'm going to transition to Ernst. Um, there's quite a bit in common between Ernst and Samala. They both come from Nyack, New York, um, and they both came from immigrant families. So I think it's interesting to see that now they're both in positions where they've created seats of power for themselves. Um, Ernst and I have, have also known each other for years and have talked for years about what it really looks like to just change the paradigm and stop, stop uh, being so polite about it in terms of the, the current state that we're in and instead just taking those big steps forward to make a difference and, and not being apologetic for it. So uh, Ernst, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things you've done and, 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 and where you see yourself fitting into this conversation? Thank you all so much for having me on this panel. I actually just want to listen to everyone. <laughs> um, it's, it's amazing because, um, you know, being an immigrant, being a person of color um, and then getting to go to some of these institutions, you know, going to really great schools and coming out of those schools and then really being told that you've just been prepared to take on some middle management, like to be a check in someone's uh, list. Like, yeah, we have that in our company. And I kind of rejected that early on because of, you know, one experience that I had was um, I traveled abroad as an undergrad and graduate student, and I lived in Italy. And you realize how it took six months to get like a. And that entire six months was completely decimated when the cell phone came around, right? And so I give, give that example because. Right now we've got all sorts of movements, but I don't actually see uh, anything changing, right? Uh, I always say if you came down from, you know, some sort of planet and you landed on earth, you would think the NFL um, owners uh, created uh, the Black Lives Matters movement, right? You would, so there's a way in this country that we take these very serious things and we co-op them and at the end of the day they they end up meaning nothing and so one of the things that i have done uh is said you know how do i create a new platform that recognizes the challenges because part of what we're doing is we're telling folks black lives matters me too uh, all these lives matters, but then when it comes to money, well, we've got to change and be something else so that we can get money. And it doesn't make any sense because sometimes you also see that the money is actually ours, right? It, it's, it's money from the federal government. It's money from unions and uh, dues that are paid by very poor people or very hardworking class folks. And that money somehow ends up in the hands of um, people who basically say, in order for you to get it, you have to be us, you have to turn into, so how do you tell someone to be their authentic self? And in order for them to get recognized, they have to code switch or whatever we call it. And so, uh, you know, we're in real estate, we're in food, we're also in technology. Our primary um, kind of avenue or business is real estate, but I always tell folks, I'm not a real estate developer. You know, we have an innovation company. And so, you know, my background is urban planning. And so when we go into a city and, you know, they have issues, we start with the city's issues, not so much do we say, well, we build this type of apartment building and that's what we're, we're, we're gonna do. And this is why I collaborate with wonderful people like Trevor, because 
when we go into a situation, there's a real estate element to it, but there's also a people element. And there's also this the infrastructure that we've got to put in place to be able to allow folks to succeed in their authentic self and their authentic voice. And what we found, especially in real estate, um, we started a small fund three and a half months ago, six and a half million dollars. And we said, what would it look like to provide equity and not debt and not, um, you know, some sort of like, um, you know, uh, really complicated equity structure that at the end, it's, you know, you, you end up working for someone, right? Uh, you're, you're not really working for yourself. What would it look like to start small, right? Because a lot of times, you know, real capital, they say, well, we don't wake up unless you need 20 million, 30 million. And that's actually a cop out for not allowing inclusion because they know that you know, hey, we've ignored you for the last 53 years. And so, of course, you're not going to be able to start with like a 10 million, $20 million investment. So it's an easy way to say, we don't want to mess with you. So you've got to get all this experience before you can come to us. So we started this fund really simple. We had plans on getting more complicated, but we needed to start the fund where folks can pull entryway. Uh, so we said 100% with equity and it's a small house or a row house or a new construction home. And what we're finding is, and, and we focus our fund on women, immigrants, minorities, uh, underrepresented minorities. And I started looking into that word itself and most cities are, you know, like Baltimore where I live or Philadelphia, they're majority black the majority women, and yet we're still called the minorities. <laughs> and so you have to start thinking about, you know, what does minority mean, really? Uh, and it's really how you relegate people to as a second class citizen. And you say nothing is in your image. We're not trying to help push you forward. But long story short, this fund that we started has almost doubled in four months, because the folks that are that we're giving that first opportunity for equity investment, they actually understand the markets more than the people that just drop in and kind of uh, get all the capital. And they're motivated, they are not afraid of the communities, right? So everyone kind of sits back and says, whoa, I remember when Harlem was really bad and you know, Harlem was always a great place to invest. So was Brooklyn. So was, you know, South Philly. The only reason people didn't invest, it's because they saw people of color and they didn't want to invest in people of color. And so we're really going out there. Our fund will go from, now it's 10 million. It's going to 65 million in the next 15 months. And we want to get the billions of dollars that are invested in people from the community that get the community that have never been given an opportunity to get fair equity. It's always debt. Whenever you talk about a black person getting capital, it's structured as debt, loan to own, and something that's truly disruptive in, in their lives. It, it doesn't want them to succeed. It wants to take value from them, co-opt that value, and turn it into something that's purely their own. And we've got to change that. Right. Well. Thank you so much. Um, these are such wonderful insights and thank you to all the panelists for such wonderful projects that you're currently working on.